Hey, welcome to Min Potion Stream. You're watching it on Twitch. Um, this is Epic Tavern, and these are the guys who are making it. Hyperkinetic Studio. How's it going, Ben? Super good. Um, so, you know, full disclosure, they're friends of mine. I've backed the game and everything. It's super sweet. Um, and I don't even know where to begin talking about it. It's gone through so many updates. Um, where do you even want to start? Like, who's here? So hey, John. What? <laughs> <laughs> Is this uh, work? Yeah, you, uh, well, I can, I can, I can no, attach a keyboard no to it. Reading it is very, very useful. Excellent. I can speak to what anyone asks or says. Uh, my name is Tomo Moriwaki. Uh, I'm a design director for Epic Tavern and uh, one of the co-founders of Hyperkinetic Studios. And I'm Rich Pito, uh, president and CTO of, of uh, Hyperkinetic. Your, Your mic. mic. I'm Rich Pito, uh, president and CTO of Hyperkinetic and one of the co-founders along with Tomo and... We have fun. Yes. That's well, wonderful. We've been working on this game for more than a year now. Um, we started it um, back towards the end of, what was it, 2015? 15, right? 15, yeah. And um, we, wanted to, uh, we, we wanted to make a game that we're going to love to play and, and something that we maybe haven't seen exactly in the, uh, in the marketplace. Uh, we like a lot of different kinds of games, uh, although we do have a strong intersection uh, with each other uh, on RPGs and um, strategy experiences. And, you know, we are, for better or for worse, very much PC, well, at least parts of us are PC, very strong PC players, uh, or at least very fervent PC players. And uh, so combining those ideas seemed to be a natural fit for uh, Steam PC. And so we started to get to work uh, trying to envision a game that would work for, for the Steam audience. And uh, this is what we came up with. Um, you want to kind of like do some of the underlying uh, foundations of the game idea? Okay, yeah. Uh, it started a long time ago when I was working a whole lot and I really wanted to uh, find a way that I could be playing a game um, that fit in with, with my kind of busy schedule. So, you know, the, of course the origins of the games are often different of the where they end up. Um, so I came up with an idea because I played things like Kingdom of Loathing, you know, I'd play games like Crusader Kings, play games like uh, Dwarf Fortress. And I said, man, I would love it if there was a game that had all these kind of personalities of adventurers that were going out on quests, and I could kind of follow along with those quests. And they're questing all the time, but I, I could follow along with those quests um, whenever I had time to. And I could make, you know, little decisions about what people were going to do and how things were going to go. And then maybe there would be some you know, baddies showing up from time to time, like get a nemesis kind of system going. And, and Shadow so then... <laughs> what? Shadow Mordor. Shadows of Mordor. Then Shadows of Mordor I came out. <laughs> I forgot all about my idea, and then I died. Uh, no, it was actually... <laughs> it was actually uh, and then we got together with these guys, and I forget exactly where the, the tavern uh, aspect of it tavern came from. Came in that wasn't a, tavern came in a little bit late, uh, actually. A game about mm -hmm. emergent fantasy storytelling and uh, RPG progression... Uh, being able to have more characters mm -hmm. uh, than a conventional party, uh, make it more about the make it more experiential and less mechanical in a lot of ways. Um, you know, it doesn't take a whole lot of thinking, and it sounds obvious in hindsight. But the fantasy taverns is totally the intersection of all all things fantasy in a lot of cases, and so uh, that became the center place, and that led us to the role that the player uh, takes up as the owner of a tavern. Yep, um, I mean tavern was just. It just made sense. It's like we were we were just talking uh, a little bit ago uh, with one of the one of the founders of Mint Potion here, and we were talking about kind of uh, drawing your ideas from from another universe that, uh, that where you've already had the idea, and it kind of feels like that a lot of times with this game. It, you know, a lot of it just really comes naturally, um, which I think is is a great sign that you're onto something good. Um, I don't know, in in my opinion, anyway. Hey, Locoratos, what's going on? <laughs> um, that might be an illusion because uh, <laughs> discovering knowledge from another universe is indistinguishable from figuring out something new. <laughs> it's true. It's true. And so, at its core, the game, kind of from a gameplay mechanical standpoint, is a combination of um, sports management gameplay mechanics uh, combined with uh, fantasy storytelling and a very light business sim where you need to keep the business of your tavern afloat. Uh, the, t the people that come into the tavern to buy drinks and eat food uh, end up becoming the 
the legendary heroes of the fantasy world that it, the tavern is set in. Mm. And so, so I think with that, I might at least start mm. stepping us through the experience of playing here a bit. Sure. I, awesome. What do you guys like pull? What do you when you're when you're looking through like sports manager games and these types of simulators? Like, what are the elements that you're pulling out? Like the feelings or like you know well, something really strange happens in sports management games. They're about spreadsheets. They're about business management. They're about scouting the right talent, and they're about soccer, mostly about soccer or okay, other, okay. other sports games. But when you play them enough, what they become is a player-authored, rich, unique storytelling experience. And in a lot of cases, our imagination fills in a lot of interesting details, but okay. that wouldn't have been possible if the game didn't have so much nuance and so many complex systems interacting to create right, right. the variety that they do. Hmm. Well, yeah, don't let me keep it. Let's make them a new tavern. Right. That's so cool. Someone asks, when will the oh, game yeah. be out? And we are shooting to launch the game in early access on September 7th. Way that soon. Is, That's right. Good. That is definitely brown pants close. <laughs> <laughs> so another thing, um, as he's starting this up, another thing that, that um, kind of relates back to the sports stuff is like, I love the sports management games. I love kind of the way they get into the depth of the data and the personalities and the management. But I don't, I don't really dig the sports theme. I know a lot of people do. I personally don't. So I was like, why, you know, at a certain point we're just like all this fantasy, you know, football and soccer and everything. Why, why not do a fantasy fantasy, right? Um, it's pretty I cool. mean, that's, uh, you know, we, I said that before in the, the, one of the original trailers, but it's, it's just super true, right? I mean, that nobody's really done too many of those. I mean, there have been a few that have been done, mm -hmm. for sure. Um, but we wanted to really just go kind of full insanity that we bring to the table. And, and just push it as hard as we possibly could. Well, and I feel like uh, <coughs> the audience out there right now is also starting to really, well, they're starting to enjoy a wider variety of, of narrative-based games. Mm -hmm. And so those games tell a story because of what the, the way the mechanics come together. Mm -hmm. uh, we just decided to make that a more overt part of the experience. So yep. uh, we have um, a game with... Do, you might want to destroy those other two taverns, by the way. Okay. Because I just like to watch the world burn. That's okay. My third or fourth practice tavern <laughs> completely eliminated. Here's something uh, fun. We have yeah. some. Uh, we have a random tavern name generator. Let's oh, take a cool. look and see what the name of today's favorite, tavern is. My favorite. Heretical goat. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sold. You know what's funny is, no matter how weird these names gets, these names get. There's always something strangely appropriate about them. Oh yeah, absolutely. It's another element that we can kind of draw story out of, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, well, of course that would happen at the heretical goat, honestly. <laughs> and so... All right. So here's a view of the, the tavern phase of the game. Ah. It's a 3D view of a tavern, and you see patrons coming in and having seats. Right now, what you see is they all have these um, uh, icons over their head that uh, say that you haven't met them before except for the person who has that scroll with the uh, exclamation point who has a quest for you. This game has grown the heck up. I've seen it come through <laughs> so many phases of, you know, look development and, you know, different iterations of the UI and through the Kickstarter updates as well. Just like, it is getting way stinking pretty. It is something that not everyone gets to see. Like every step of the way the game goes from really, there's no way to see anything other than a big pile of crap. And then the end result, well, the end results vary, of course, but it is always much better at the end. And there's this weird kind of like exponential swing at the end where things get better really quick, or at least it feels that way. Mm -hmm. So I'm just gonna click on one of these random characters here. Let's see, this new patron. It was called a new patron before, and now we get to see that the new patron's name is Terrence Barden, a level two class unknown, uh, which become known once we talk to them a little bit further. So um, that's kind of part of the, one of the pillars of the game, right? is that there's an idea of you creating relationships with people. Um, so what you see is kind of the first step of that right there. You don't know any of these people that are in here, except for maybe you know this guy's name, Tar Terrence now. But the more you talk to them, the more you get to know them, the more you establish friendship with them, the better um, of, a, of a time you give them while they're in the tavern, the, um, the more your relationship with them builds. And that unlocks things like knowing more about them, um, knowing things about their backstory, knowing you know more about their traits, uh, and once you know more about an individual character's backstory, it could just be color, it could be things that, that, you, that you find out that are awesome about them. Um, 
but it could also unlock things that are of consequence in the game world, like um, you know items, like quests, like other characters. So it really does pay to get to know all of your all of your patrons. When we wanted to create a game where it wasn't ab absolutely clear what you had to do to min max the experience. I mean, there's a lot of numbers with the RPG and the leveling mm -hmm. up of characters, which totally plays the way you'd expect. Mm -hmm. But the overall game is kind of this. Uh, happenstance generator that a character can start any of the things in the game an item can start any of the other things in a game a quest of course can start can bring you you know access to characters or items or new quests and all those things swirl around together and kind of freely unlock each other so it kind of has a kind of a more organic feel uh, trying to create an emergent narrative experience for us was uh, well was one of the principal difficulties because our ideas about narrative are really like ingrained yeah and uh you know i'm sure most of the audience has at least had some period in their life where they're reading too much and uh, we just get really accustomed to to kind of experiencing it in, in an order so it comes it becomes difficult to build it in, not build it in that order hey so, shimmer kenzai what's going on uh, nice to see cool. you rich was just there i was just in tijuana <laughs> <laughs> so i'm gonna i'm gonna introduce myself here and characters after you talk to them they'll have something to say and they're saying, this one's saying that our tavern is not exactly the Grand Hilltop, but any port in a storm, eh? The name's Terrence. So the Grand Hilltop is another another tavern in the uh, in the world. Okay. And that's another thing we're going to be expanding on um, as we go forward, or at least one of the potential vectors of expansion for the game um, would be introducing the idea that there are other taverns actively competing against you in the world. Oh, cool. Um, so as your tavern increases in reputation, um, as w we'll talk a little bit more about that later on, um, you're able to kind of see where your tavern sits mm -hmm. in terms of reputation. Oh, neat. Um, and as you overtake the other taverns, even potentially do things like go on quests that allow you to eventually absorb that tavern. Oh, and so I can become like the evil McDonald's tavern that exactly. like takes over mm -hmm. Vior and or the benevolent one, <laughs> or the true. benevolent McDonald's <laughs> tavern. Maybe you, you, you have to be <laughs> McDonald's man. <laughs> you think you're benevolent, and they all think you're malevolent. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and so things are set up right now, so it's fairly easy to get people onto your roster. Mm -hmm. uh, but the way the game works is kind of relating to what Rich said. The game is about relationship, and that's the word. That's where the numbers actually matter as well. So we have a friendship value you have with any of these characters, and as you cross friendship value thresholds, different things become available. And in this case, their willingness for you to add them to your roster. Yeah, there you go. You got your first. So inspiring, uh, spending an evening here at your tavern. <laughs> I want to be part of something bigger. And so a lot of these areas where you're seeing text, it's all kind of a procedure. Like some of it's procedurally generated, some of it is randomly unlocked, uh, some of it's custom written in, and the result here is that, I mean, the idea here is that you're getting bits of the story from lots of different places, and it kind of helps you feel like the story that's there is one that you're telling yourself. Mm. Mm -hmm. So now that character's on our roster. One thing here, the story of the character over here on the right lower area is being populated, and everything this character has to say to me will get recorded there, so any individual character also represents their own singular story. All the characters together represent my big story, well, all the characters plus all the adventures they went on. Right. Over here is a character who has a quest icon over their head. I really can't wait to get to the story part. Like, that's <laughs> a really great feature of this game. The cobbler mentioned this. Tell oh, me dude. more. And a quest has been acquired. And here, the quest is called The Only Good Rat. The tavern has an unfinished basement, which could be converted into a wine cellar. It would require the extermination of the ill-tempered rats that currently have the run of the place. But surely there's an adventure or two who would help who would be up to the task. And so for us in a lot of cases, we, the way in which, like the ideas of the story we want to tell, first of all, we want to have a lot of variety so that everyone can find the type of story experience that they like. But more importantly, we like to tell jokes. We, um, we want to play straight man and tell jokes about fantasy literature. And we know that everyone has a, a ton of back history, nerd history of fantasy literature and stories that we've all been exposed to over time. And so that, that feel, we felt like that was a, something important we wanted to riff on. So I get this quest. And I'm going to find another character to add. Uh, this is Cranston Grimm. Uh, as you can see here, it's going to take 500 relationship points to get him to want to join uh, my uh, party. So that's not going to happen anytime soon. But something interesting about this character is he's a quest hub of sorts. And you'll get to know his personal story 
On the side here, you can see a whole line of uncovered, uh, of locked personal story elements. And you'll get to hear who he is, what he's about, and along the way, he'll give you a bunch of quests. And at the very end of it, we give you a reward where he'll, a very powerful character will get to be added to your roster. So how do I get friendship points? If I trust him or if I, like, how well, does, you know? So the whole idea of friendship, about it's split between the tavern and playing the, the, the adventure part of the game, which we'll, I'll try to get to very, very soon. Okay. But here, just talking to him, and I'm getting, I'm gathering relationship points just by chatting with him. Okay. And his character, his character intro is Heretical Goat. What kind of name is Heretical Goat? Guess I shouldn't talk. My folks name me Cranston. And after, you know, I continued the conversation with him and he decided he wanted to ask for a soda water. And this is where some of the uh, business sim aspects, and sim is kind of a strong word, but mm. the light business sim, uh, uh, experience for the player comes into play where I'm giving people what they ask for, getting money, building relationship with them. And that kind of cooks at this kind of like moderate rate throughout the, throughout the whole experience. So as you'll see, everything that he's doing, or more, most things he's doing, are costing uh, action points. Ah. And that's how we kind of simulate the passage of time over, an, over a, you know, a day and night cycle in the, ta the and tavern. If you're paying attention to the tavern, it will go from daytime to nighttime. Right. So here's an example of, a, uh, of, of something Cranston wants to say about himself. Yeah, I have something to say, tell me more. And he just, these, a lot of these statements are kind of setups for later statements. Sometimes life gets a bit predictable and dull. That's where I come in. Cranston, the chaos bringer. So here is Theodore <laughs> Aiden, but actually what I would like to do is find Murgle Flame Tongue. This is uh, one of the characters that, we're, that, is, that has been custom written for the game. Uh, in the tutorial experience, she'll be the one, that, one of the ones you add to your roster to do that rat's quest. So, so how do you, um, just kind of a leading question, like now as you're going through and you're spending your action points when you're fooling around in the tavern um, and you just hired somebody, right? So can you hire as many people as you want or how are you strategizing how you're spending your action points? So the game the is a pretty complicated game and so there's a lot of features and there are a lot of things that a player might eventually will have to be keeping track of. But mm -hmm. in this case, you have a limited number of adventures that you can have in your, on your roster. And uh, as your tavern developed reputation, which you can see up here is this value. Mm -hmm. um, uh, it unlocks more slots and you can hire on more and more uh, adventures. Eventually you might find yourself having as many as 16 adventures and be able to go on anywhere from kind of like five or more quests at, one, at the same time. Whoa. Um, how, how do I That'll pick? be up to the player though. How, how do I pick between the different adventures? Like which ones do I, how do I know which ones I'm gonna spend my, my points on? Well, as you play with them longer and longer, uh, you'll get an idea of what their skills are. And so Terence is a level two survivalist, nice. has a certain number of skills here, and um, a certain you know, set of equipment, which we'll be upgrading, I'm sure, in the near future. Uh, Murgle Flame Tongue is a level one fire mage, and we have a whole system in here for uh, gaining skills, and when you level up, you get more skills. And when you go on adventures, uh, depending on what you're doing and who's, who goes on it, you'll get, you'll get, you'll get what, skills from that as well. I could see that we have their personal story kind of unlocking under here and opening up more details about who they are. Do we talk to... Back. Yeah. Murgle Flametug is going to want to say something about herself. All right. She says, despite what that nosy do-gooder Catrice would have you believe, I'm perfectly respectable mage. But I'm perfectly respectable by mage standards. And what will happen is Catrice is another character we've written in, and there are some quests that involve the two of these characters later down the line that eventually will emerge that you can participate, uh, get them participating in. So we have two characters, we have a quest, and uh, even though I haven't spent all the AP, and it would have been a, a reasonable idea for me to do that to kind of soak up more cash, sell more liquor, and kind of get an idea of these other characters that are here. We like thinking about this, these characters in the tavern as kind of like a, uh, an unknown data configuration, just waiting for a player to uncover what's there. And in doing so, creating all these options for you. Mm. So this is the world map view. And so we have this view of the land of Bayor, we call it. Kind of sounds like beer. It's a tavern. <laughs> There's lots of ale. Okay, I was wondering where that get the came picture. from. <laughs> <laughs> and we have these two characters on our roster, and we have this The Only Good Rat quest available to us. So what does it mean by wanted down there? Wanted down where? Uh, the power, zero out of 10. Okay, yeah. So. Uh, the way our content works is that by sending characters on these quests, they travel the land and they run into uh, different kinds of challenges. 
And those challenges are broken into four major categories, uh, combat, mind, social, and survival. Uh, one of the things we realized when we were trying to kind of how do you create a fantasy story and realize the difference between your typical video game and the, the literature that all of those games have been built off of is that the stories that are written have a lot more challenges that relate to social interactions and solving puzzles and surviving the elements in particular. And you don't see a lot of that in games because in games you have to make a fight system. Once you make a fight system, that took a lot of effort. You've got to make your game about fighting. Okay. Um, but for us, since it's all writing and it's all about storytelling, uh, there's nothing stopping us from doing that. So our character classes are actually distributed equally across all of these types of challenges. And this particular quest is a combat quest. Okay. And so Murgle the Fire Mage is totally going to help us out. Has 14 points of power in combat. If you need someone incinerated, that's kind of my specialty. <laughs> and we have Terrence here. Oh, it's so cool. inspiring spending an evening at your tavern. Technically, those are reusing <laughs> strings, and we have a lot more strings that we're going to put in there. So that's awesome. there. It's there. There. I'm being added to this quest, and I'd like to say something strange. So what's going on? Your power once you added those guys went up to 23. And so the characters have a, a configuration of skills that are uh, arranged inside of those four major uh, encounter types, and uh, those the skill levels that they have are added up, and that represents their power against that particular ah. type of encounter. Right. And so what's that? What's the, uh, the little compass of different things up there? Was so you, this, this uh, yellow icon with the swords is combat, and the one below it in green is mind, and the one to the left in blue is social, and orange is survival. It gives you an idea of how prepared this party is to kind of tackle the challenges that might lie ahead. So you're an antisocial, kind of smart, kind of tough, kind of tough party. Rugged, but right. very, very, a little on the violent side, perhaps. Awesome. So for me, what I try to do when I go out is I... Like my strategy is when I'm stacking a party or when I'm stacking my roster, I want to get a, a broad enough, you know, kind of docket of skills mm -hmm. so that I can, you know, pretty much beat any type of a challenge for the main part of the quest, which you see down there, the 23 and 10. But I want to have my party prepared for anything they're going to meet along the way as well, uh. which means that they're going to have, you know, if they run into a social stage along the way. Right. On the quest, so they're going to be able to happen. hit it. Yeah. Right, exactly. I mean, now, this ex this first quest, because it's part of the tutorial, happens at the tavern and in the basement, and right. in very stereotypical fashion, clearing out a basement full of rats. It's very Baldur's Gate. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I think we we should probably come up with a list of games and put them on our website. All the games that have rats <laughs> in the cellar. Um, we but were <laughs> normally the destinations for these quests are all over this world map, and so the only thing that you know is the thing that you need to overcome to complete that quest. But along the way, the game uh, procedurally selects encounters to oh, cool. uh, have the party face. And at which point then being prepared for anything can be very useful. Yep. At the same time, if you want to hedge your bets and focus on the, on, the, on the task that you're trying to accomplish, you are free to min-max your party depending on a lot of different points of view. Interesting. So how do you, when, when, when you know, dealing with the world of these quests and composing them, um, like you mentioned before, there are kind of quest lines that open up, and also a lot of chaos. A lot of random things could happen. Yeah. Um, you know, the tutorial will lead us through a line of events with maybe less chaos. But you know, when you're trying to navigate this whole world of adventure and mm -hmm. you know strange characters that wander into your tavern, like how do you how do you plant those things? You know, how do you right. make a path for somebody to go? Ooh, wait, hold on. You said something about turkeys. I like turkeys. <laughs> you know, they, you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. Well, I think we created a really we create a concrete path, but rather than have uh, the sides of that path uh, blocked away, mm. we have a lot of noise and potential all around the, the path that you take. So one, there are procedural things that happens along the path, but that you can't really control. Mm -hmm. But there are quests that happen that have become available uh, randomly. A, a, a large body of quests have become uh, a randomly available depending on uh, whether quests are available right now and what you've done. Um, and those give you all these opportunities to do whatever you want, whatever you want, hmm. um, but tuck that, those roads are still important. So we have these long quest chains and quest chains that lead to other quest chains that tell these multi-chapter stories. All right, well, and let's chain this quest up. How do we, how do we get going? Let's What's up, right. Leo Z? So we click, go forth, and this uh -oh. is kind of our procedural storytelling. Yeah. And so what happens is that, uh, yeah, uh, the first <laughs> stage here is one that we wrote up specifically. So we're going to clear some rats out of the cellar. Kind of exciting to engage in something so stereotypical, Terrence says, rubbing his hands together. 
And then the, we get to the quest objective. So this is the, the <laughs> encounter that is relevant to the quest. It happens very quickly because the destination is close. Okay. An angry chittering greets the intruders as the pack of rats rushes to attack. We roll the dice. Fire Whoa. Mage Murgle uses combat, rolls 95% excellent performance, and has a bonus to their contribution. So the idea, see what's popping up right there? It says coming soon. The idea is basically that we're going to be able to take and break down all these numbers for, you know, you could just take a look at it. If you're if your person is not really into the stats, you're just in it for the story. Yeah. You can just read through it and you can see that you succeeded. You read through what happened. Uh, if you don't even care about the story, you can just go, okay, I succeeded, fine. Um, but if you're really, really into the stats, we support that. Oh, we want to support you as far down as you want to delve. So being able to mouse over these things is eventually going to yield you a whole bunch of information about how we arrived at all those numbers. And, we and can kind of how like your party's composition and the power and everything. Right, you can kind of see who's gaining more experience where. Yes. And maybe like, yep. you know, take in a weaker member and like, right. you know, make them stronger. Right. With like a strong party or yep. like, hey, that guy's getting a little beefy. He'll go on yeah. another team. Or, That's pretty cool. You know, if you really want to be cutthroat about it when you're managing your, your, your teams, you go, that person kind of has a tendency to underperform. Uh. <laughs> like maybe they're just not holding <laughs> their way. I've been having my eye on this other person who's been coming <laughs> to the tavern. Maybe I swap them out because I don't have enough slots, right? Yeah. So, you know, you could, you know, or you might just get be very attached to them and go, ah, <laughs> you know, they're kind of crappy, but we're going to keep them. Hey, Leo Z, welcome to the stream. We're checking out Epic Tavern. It's pretty cool so far. So we've succeeded in our quest. Yep. I think we have and we defeated the here. small pack of rats. Then there's a, a stage with travel that describes that they return to the tavern. Although okay. technically this one should probably say goes back upstairs. Yeah. You can and write I think, that one in custom. I think the latest data does have that too. Okay, so this is kind of uh, nice. our first place. This is, you know, an older version of our UI, but it gives you all the information you need, and it tells you everything that kind of happened on your quest. Now, here's something that really important that happens, and something that we w that I want to kind of hi highlight how you know the the one of the vectors and where the game is going to be developing. So you have the ability to divvy up the loot that you got from the quest, mm -hmm. which is like what uh, 219 gold. Um, so you can put all of it to the party or you can put all of it to the tavern, and then you can, on an individual basis, um, divvy up that loot between, between the, the oh. individual characters okay, okay. that are on the squad. Now, one of the cool things that's gonna happen is that um, when we get the, the character personalities and traits really up and running, mm. um, they're gonna be seeking characters that are, for instance, greedy. So it'll take a higher amount of gold to, to kind of squeeze friendship out of them as, as they go along. The consequences is mm -hmm. loss or gain in relationship points. Exactly. And then you'll have some characters that are jealous. And uh. if they don't get as much money or more money than everybody else, yeah. then, they, then you'll see a big drop in the amount of friendship that, that you get from them. So it's, there's some really interesting thing vectors yeah. we're going along that, that we're going to be playing with as, as the game develops over time. So I have a quick question from Leo Z. Mm -hmm. uh, what if my team power has a minimum requirement for the quests, like 10 versus 10, right? So there's a, there's a percentage chance of success that we uh, analyze and try to deliver to you. Uh, if you had exactly 10 versus 10, your chances of success are probably roughly in the 60-ish percent range. Mm -hmm. But yeah. that's only for the actual encounter for the uh, quest itself. Any of the things along the way might end up being in a, a different uh, uh, encounter type, and you may not have the same numbers for those. That's right. And that's, and that's really important to take into consideration because, mm. so let's say it's just like going up to, let's say I'm playing a few matches to get, uh, qualifying matches to get into the final round, right? Even if you somehow make it to the final round and you get a player injured along the way, mm -hmm. or somebody you know um, loses morale because they're not getting paid enough or whatever, or they run into some bad situation, they run into an ex-girlfriend uh, of theirs or a boyfriend <laughs> of theirs, so and they encounter. get upset. This could and happen. those status effects that, yeah. that I mean, tho going through those types of, uh, types of encounters will um, impart status effects upon the characters, oh, right? Okay. So when they go into the final, final round, um, to the final uh, key, key, que key stage of the quest, um, they're going to be at a negative. So even if they oh. perform really well, they might get dragged down by the fact that they're thinking about their ex, or they might get dragged down by the fact that they got their leg cut off, right. or, you know... So uh, like the steps along the way towards right. the quest are going to affect their personality. That is correct. And I mean... For like not this quest, but you know, you also have to make it back. Right. Yeah. Right. You're not just like going there to like kick the dragon's butt and that teleport. That is correct. Right. So you have to yep. survive that yep. clash of personalities. Right. And you have oh to plan my. for that too. And and there's a whole bunch of you know just talking briefly about length, right? Yeah. Um, if you're sending a party out and they're going to be gone for like like six days on a really f a quest that's really far away. Yeah. You have to take that into account when you're planning your strategy for 
you know, who, who you're going to have on your roster. Because some quests might come up in the meantime. Or you might run low on cash in the meantime. Mm. Um, there's, there's all sorts of stuff you need to be keeping an eye on. And it's only going to get more awesome as time goes um, on. Speaking yeah. of, like, cash, like, mm -hmm. uh, what's it? Yeah. Uh, Vince asks. Other than gold coins, asks Vince Gallup. And we have items, uh, magical items. or We have three equipment slots and items are arrayed across the level progression scheme uh, that give you bonuses to various skills and certain mm. status effects. Um, we also have uh, goods. Like uh, more, you know, you can you can find like a, a keg of beer and bring it back, and, and, and the tavern can make use of that. Oh, cool! All right. And some and some some of the like drinks and food you have available at the tavern can be stuff that you have a steady supply of, so you can just choose how much you buy any given turn. And some of it's special stuff you bring back that you'll have to you'll be able to serve to a few people. And of course, those will come with some modifiers and some foods better than others. Some drinks are better than others. Mm. Are we going to see a? Uh, are we going to see any of the, the tavern quests coming up real soon, or um, let's that, see? Because that um, because that that's kind of awesome too. That's the other thing. This like is a long that. session kind of game. It's the kind of game what we want to do is make a game that has a lot of value for single player experience. That once you buy it, that it's it's a crap load of entertainment and time that you can spend mm -hmm. on this, and and we'll keep supporting it so that you can do that forever. Cool. Yep. Which sometimes isn't perfectly amenable to a single stream. <laughs> yeah, I have to, I have to, I have to admit, I have seen some of the like early notes and sketches of this game. Yeah, and it goes deep. Like it just, <laughs> you guys have a very, very long plan for if you if you can work on it. You know, yep. you'd yep. want to do that. It can, it can go yep. for a while. Well, and my feeling is like, I love playing games like that. So does Rich. Like, yep. getting way into something, yeah. it's more memorable. It's something you develop a relationship. Here's something weird. I don't like. I mean, I do like bringing esoteric thoughts into conversation. <laughs> if we both played the same game for a thousand hours, we're a whole lot more like each other now. Yeah. <laughs> it's true. I mean, like, I mean, the way that the way that I view this, this what we're going to be coming out with in EA. Mm -hmm. um, and I mean, maybe it's a good time to talk a little bit about why we chose to do early access. Of course. I mean, I think that um, this game can go in so many directions. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's like you said, you're looking at the original notes of it, and, and you know, we were able to accomplish, a, I think, a good deal of that, but, yeah. like, um, there's so many ways that this game can go, and we're a small team, right? And we only have so much so much time, no matter what. Uh, so we thought it was would be a great experience to go into early access and actually have the community help us to kind of determine what direction we're going to oh, take yeah. the game as, as time goes on. Um, and I think what we're coming into early access with is a good stable base yeah. for for what could become just like a ridiculous game as time goes on, um, and and we know that the you know the kind of the, the mind being able to benefit and this is one of the kind of princi core principles of hyperkinetic mm -hmm. as a whole is being able to benefit from a myriad of viewpoints of different viewpoints, yeah. um, you know, from every demographic, from every you know gender, from every age. Um, from every, you know, other, any other kind of vector you can imagine, just um, increases the amount of, of choices that you have to make, to make whatever you're working on great. Mm -hmm. um, and something we firmly believe, and I think Early Access fits that, that thought, you know, that belief like, perfectly. I think it's a real great candidate, especially for people to restore faith in Early Access. Like Steam has been in oh some yeah. kind of turmoil for a lot of not great games, and this already at an alpha stage has like you know the early access build of this game and previous versions of it coming through the kickstarter have been head and shoulders above a lot of the content that shows up there and i think that that'll definitely help it get to the top and get an active community there aren't a lot of strategy like management games in general yeah and I, I i really think you know i want it to be super successful i think it'll i think it can do that oh well, thanks man. i want it to be too but the the only way that's going to happen is is our users. And yeah. another reason for early access. <laughs> Get in players. touch with you guys as soon as possible. Yep. We're, we're here the to listen. Art. Oh, so thanks a lot, Leo. How did you guys get this art designed? How did your, your art direction, your, your your feel? You know, I think I think in some ways the direction was almost obvious. Okay. Because if we just shave away all the things that we don't want to see, take a look at all the games out there and the kind of vibe that they have, mm -hmm. and then also <laughs> budget out what we can do. Mm. <laughs> Combine right. those things, and I think you might get something like this. So what you're seeing here is a, is a great combination of of, of tremendous talents. Um, so there's a, a fellow who's our art director um, named Remy Benoist, and he was kind of the foundational structure, mm -hmm. uh, or prime mover behind you know the way that everything's looking. 
uh, kind of the the way the the art is developed overall in the game, not just the tavern itself, but the characters and everything else. Um, then you have you know kind of 2D conceptual support from Kate Sotovia, mm -hmm. who uh, pushed things in really great direction from our point of view. Um, and then finally, uh, an, a great old friend of ours, James Chow, okay. who came in and um, not only uh, did a lot of the kind of bells and whistles and kind of lighting and particles and mood that you see here with the tavern. Um, you know, he's just a technical art artistry wizard and overall artistry wizard. Um, but he also, you know, supported the game in just about every way you can imagine as well. Yeah. So, you know, it's a lot of great people coming together to, to make, you know, make something pretty awesome, you know, that we're, yeah. that we're definitely proud of. And that you're only going to see develop and, and become, you know, better as time goes on. Uh, you know, so, so talking about the tavern, other things that, that are going to happen is, um, you know, you can't really see it. And there's a lot of stuff that, bi okay, big deal with this game is just messaging stuff. There's a lot of stuff going on under the hood. Okay. So our, our, one of our primary challenges was just making sure that we're actually messaging the things that are, that are going on. Right. Um, one of the things going on in the background is when everybody's drinking, they're getting drunk. Okay. Um, so, <laughs> and, uh, you know, that's going to have an effect on, on their, their performance the right. next day. If you put somebody who's hung over on a, uh, you know, a quest, I mean, that might not be in by early access, our launch for early access. That's something we're planning on. But, um, you know, drunkenness in the tavern, uh, you know, how that affects your interactions with people and your ability to build friendship with them. Um, we've got a lot of complex thoughts on that subject yeah. that we want to explore. Um, just actually, like, you know, messaging to you when somebody's drunk and fallen over and right. passed out. And like would something like a bar fight anymore. like mess up the yeah. flow of the tavern? Or Dude, yeah. I mean, it's going to cost you money, yeah. but it might end up, you know, maybe some people lose friendship. Maybe some people gain friendship right. because of bar fights. <laughs> bar fight um, <laughs> is really an important idea we want to capture. We yeah. just needed to get all this. It's It was so essential to get all the uh, plumbing for the mm -hmm. kind of interacting with these people in the tavern and uh, mm -hmm. getting the kind of the emergent narrative stuff going. Yes. But so we definitely want, what we want is compound maneuvers as yes. a result of choices you make in the tavern with these patrons yep. to create things like people buying everyone around a drink, telling mm -hmm. a story, yep. getting Breaking a out fight. into song. Okay, okay. <laughs> yeah, all coming together after the fight with a song. Um, so yeah, so Shinru Kensai, you guys already saw that um, with the, the expansions, right? Or did we, did we kind of answer that by clicking through things? Or? I mean, aside from I more mean, tables and chairs. Um, yeah. Oh, so while you guys were talking, I, I cycled yeah. through all of our expansions. Yeah. Okay, okay. So these are the expansions right now. Um, you know, that's something, uh, expansions are going to expand. Expansions going to expand, just like haters going to hate. <laughs> uh, but we're, that's, that's something that we're going to develop as time goes on. Um, so uh, uh, expansions are, are, are really related to the effects that mm -hmm. your adventurers have. So one of the central tenets of the game is that um, adventure will change your adventurers, okay. right? Yeah. Going on adventures will leave them messed up. It'll leave them cursed. It'll leave them blessed. It'll leave them... Uh, psychotic it'll leave them possessed mm. it'll leave them all sorts of things as as time goes on um, we have a few examples of that that are that are in the game right now um, some of the effects will be temporary some of them will be permanent and some of them will be semi-permanent interesting and what you want to do and you know for instance we'll take a, we'll take the simplest um the simplest example of that people are out on a quest they come back they're tired yeah yeah if you take it and you turn them right back out on another quest disadvantage Minus, right. minus some points, basically, okay. exactly. and their so ability to deal with their challenges. They're going to perform poorly. So if you take some of the money that you make off of everything that you sell, off of the loot that you get off of the, the quests, you can pour it into your facilities. Mm -hmm. And your facilities are meant to uh, be a way for you to, among other things, um, kind of uh, assuage what ails your, your, your adventurers. Yeah, it's like a right. being a hub for a guild, right? Yeah, exactly. That's, That's exactly right. You know, yeah, getting everyone out there to yep. make sure they don't die, and they, yep. you know, they can see the job board, right. and Hear the rumors in town. That, that, that's pretty crazy. Yep, and you're dealing with it. You know, the economy comes into play then too, right? Where you have, okay, I need to, and this is the great thing. This is one of the things that that, that Tomo came up with, with, which was amazing, is that um, you, it's intricately woven into the quest system as well because you have to go on quests to be able to unlock the, ab the ability to, you know, kind of expand your facilities in a certain way. So everything's kind of woven together, the money, the quests, the, the characters, mm -hmm. the adventures. And it, it's one of the challenges we face with the game, right? Where we're like, what's this game about? 
<laughs> it's like we bounce back and forth. <laughs> it's hard to have a good elevator pitch for it. Yeah, it is. Very Sometimes hard. you do a better job than others. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, uh, Loco Ratos here has got a question. Uh, is there a way to attract specific types of adventurers? Or will your tavern have a certain rep if you keep offering a certain type of quests? Oh, that's interesting. And how can I tell which ones are my adventurers? Ah. So, your adventurers, when you take a look at them, uh, let's give him what he wants has a badge next to him indicating that he's uh, on my roster oh. although Terrence doesn't yeah. I wonder if there's a Rosalie is showing as well I have a roster where I can actually see all of the characters that are on my roster as well okay right now to answer the local Ratos's question though the, in the tab oh yeah and on the right the guy the characters that have the three colored heads portraits on uh, uh, profiles are so, on your roster. But so that's a that's an ongoing challenge for us, is to message things right. ever more clearly. Yeah, yeah. Right? I mean, there are a lot of complex right. sounding systems, and yes. making sure that the yep. impact that you have on them is well right. communicated yep. is but pretty challenging. There it's is a way to attract specific types of adventurers. <laughs> what we have in presently, and we want to come up with more stuff like this, uh, there is a quest that you go on to get stables installed at the tavern. Once you have stables, you then have uh, uh, now squires can come into the tavern and then that those stables can be upgraded to level two and then knights become available they can be upgraded to level three then cavaliers become available oh so classes also change as your heroes get stronger and well we sense. have aspirations hopefully by the end of the early access period to support the feature of mm. classing characters up so oh. being able to go from one class to another because their adventures will change them mm. and the shape of a character may change you might find an opportunity for like a necromancer to become a fire mage just because that's what you want. We also think that that's a really cool idea. Any game I've ever played where I get to go from one class to another, usually, I don't know why, but it feels just insanely good. Right. <laughs> and um, then rep also has a role to play. Reputation yeah. will mm -hmm. be something like that. At least certain 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 things will happen based on uh, rep gain. Yep. And so there's something here I'd like to to show everyone here. Terrence here has this uh, kind of uh, goofy looking character with uh, his hand on his chin because he has something he wants to talk about. Mm. So he was thinking about the other day and I stop and listen. After killing those rats, I feel ready to take on the world or at least incrementally larger groups of rats. <laughs> so this is what we call, this is our reminisce system in place. All the quests that any given character goes on attaches things for them to say in the tavern afterward. So they're going to talk about all the story, their quests that they've been on with you day after day. And mm -hmm. so it's, another, it's one of our ways in which we allow for the story that happens outside of the tavern to be told inside of the tavern. And right now we have player character, we have player, well, player character, they're not player characters. We have adventurer PCs, adventure NPCs, my yeah. PCs. Oh God, this language, I don't know exactly how to... The, <laughs> the people on your roster can be either orc, human or dwarf and we'll be expanding that as time goes on with you know you guys could probably guess what the next race would be so i mean you're reminiscing with this person of a drink over a drink maybe or are you kind of dismissing that i mean so here are the choices what's, what's this the is difference? one of the opportunities for me to make a choice on how much action points i spend quick chat simply agrees and goes on and i'll get a nominal number of relationship points however reminiscing over a drink is going to give me a, is going to cost more time and get more relationship points and then additionally, though, what we want to do is like a, like a quarter second fade out to make you feel like you sat down and chit chat with the guy or girl. Cheers. Yeah. And so we can see there's another character here with a quest. <laughs> and this is actually the second quest in the initial storyline quest chain. Uh, and this is come back with my wine. So what, what was unlocked after that rat's quest was come back with my wine. And I'm just going to rush us through getting this quest started. Yeah. So you can kind of see a quest that travels the land a bit. Mm -hmm. what are we, how are we doing on time, by the way? Oh, we're fine. All right, cool. Okay. Do what you want This is, this is awesome, good. by the way, because this is one of the uh, kind of tavern quests that I was talking about before. Um, <laughs> one of the things it is basically like <laughs> developing your tavern is, is actually built into the, the, the storyline of, of the game itself. So it's kind of like, uh, you know, I mean, y'all play uh, Stardew Valley. A little, yeah. Sure. So yeah. So part of it is like building up, building up your farmhouse. Right. Being able to, when disaster strikes, you know, going on quests to try to to try to fix your farmhouse. I mean, all that type of stuff is built in, and you know, we separate them by like over here. We'll say here's all your tavern quests, um, uh. and we'll say here's all your you know your story quests, um, and 
when you get in the later game, you're going to have a bunch of quests going on at once. Mm -hmm. And you'll have like, maybe probably like, what, like up to six, maybe four to six parties out at any given time um, questing. So you'll be able to keep track of everything that's happening with them. Oh yeah, taking a look at the world. It's beautiful. So now that we have four characters, we have a little more flexibility. I now can create a pretty decent party in terms of combat, survival, and mind. Still a little short on, so on, on social. And if we weren't chit-chatting, I would have been on the hunt for a class that has more social skills. Okay. Yep. I accidentally chit-chat with Vulug and got two survivalists on the party. <laughs> Actually, heck, that so gives me a... Uh, what, what, what are you going to point out? So what's this, what's this over here with the, the mind perception tracking? Oh, what, what is, is the error? All right, so any oh. given quest might have uh, an affinity for certain skills. Mm -hmm. And so that's what you'll see in this display here, that, it, that it's, a mind it's a mind encounter, and that the uh, primary skill category of perception is desired, and the singular skill of tracking is desired. And having those skills will give you bonus to, bonuses to accomplish that uh, particular encounter. So you're like, like stacking. Yeah, now I'm a little nervous, but uh, uh, so I'm gonna give it. I'm gonna do the quest first. Okay, okay. All right, here we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna go ahead and go forth. I was gonna kick someone off the roster. Oh, don't uh, do to it. To kind of show you uh, how that works, and then go look for someone I, I would prefer to have on my roster. Tomo, Tomo points out that I'm very averse to negative social consequences, or, and being able to do <laughs> things. No, no, Rich doesn't like being able to be like not even. You're not. He doesn't like if you're able to be mean. Mm. <laughs> And we do have a very friendly environment at the office, it's true. <laughs> I, like, I like to have the freedom to be mean, I just choose not <laughs> to use it. <laughs> Murgle tightens the straps on her pack. The wind whips through the trees above the party. Looks like a storm is coming, Rosalie says. So what you see there is actually them just saying, adding color to the story of their travel. So we have travel stages are a non-consequential thing that can occur to kind of um, uh, diffuse the encounters that are uh, that have results that okay, something okay. could happen where someone could get hurt or you could fail or succeed. Kind of illustrate a little bit more of who these people are mid quest. Yeah, that's right. So the quest objective it's a mine stage. The party stops in Milston to pull out Murgle's map. The patron marked a few potential locations. A few potential locations, Feldspar Square may appear. It's up to the heroes to find them. And here we go. I think our chances are quite good though. Good. Now, here's some interesting stuff. Level 1 Fire Mage Murgle uses Mind while tired. Rolls 41, which is a good performance, contributes 8 effort minus 1. And so you can kind of start seeing about some of the kind of math under the hood that we use. Our philosophy is that we want to show you as much of that math in as naked a format as possible, but to be mindful of the experience being smooth and uh, moving along without too much hitches, trying to figure out ways to kind of nestle it correctly. So if you want information, we're the guys that want to give it to you. We're just trying to find an elegant way to do it that doesn't get in the way of the experience. So Murgle points to the mark near Gorn Flesh Cleaver's butcher shop. Sure enough, Feldspar Square is magically at the end of the street. And so now we start heading the, back. Yep. So they found the, uh, the wine merchant. The and then so here's an example of one of the procedural encounters that have occurred. Oh, interesting. The party finds a book half buried in muck. Its pages are somehow unstained, though. Oh my god, Barry, skinnier, skinnier teeth success. <laughs> so wow. we, have, we have to boost some of this messaging. There's something here to notice here. The party needs 10 effort to succeed, and they have 11.5 effort. The winds of fate blow against the party. So we have some randomization in here. In a lot of ways, you can think of our, um, our, our uh, results uh, calculations as fairly deterministic. Okay. okay. Uh, but but the, the die rolls we do use is on an individual basis. So each of them have an opportunity to have a better or worse performance. And so you can see Murgle here had a poor performance, and that cut her contribution in half. Uh, and the Winds of Fate is something that uh, we threw in there that will allow there to be variation even at that level. So in this case, we almost failed. We made it by the skin of our teeth, and the Winds of Fate were trying to connive so that we were failures. But instead, we did succeed, which is nice. So the um, contributions, the effort, the, the roles that they have kind of scale depending on their role against the entire quest. But do the consequences also scale? So we do have a number of features in play in terms of the uh, rewards and or wounds uh, and a number of negative effects that can happen to players. If you, the more you fail by, more potentially bad things can happen. And okay. the more you succeed by, 
the more potentially beneficial the rewards can be. And that's kind of our way of putting in this idea of uh, that we totally want to support people completely in an overpowered fashion if they so desire going for the maximum possible results. But as you make your way through the game, you're going to find yourself uh, pressured to kind of evenly spread out your efforts and in other cases have the freedom to concentrate your efforts. So all of these things, all of these kinds of relationships of being overpowered, being underpowered, trying to find the right balance, all of those choices come up kind of with a, a regular frequency and rhythm in the game. Mm -hmm. uh, so the adventurers are able to read the ancient text and discover it as a tome of perpetual cleanliness. Awesome. <laughs> Unfortunately, the spell doesn't work on anything besides the tome. Boo. <laughs> There's a decent example Come of some on. of the comedy we like to uh, roll here. Get out of here, you jerks. <laughs> That's pretty good. Speaking of which, I gotta, I, I, for this particular stage, I didn't add the item. Uh, I, I, I give the player the tome of perpetual cleanliness here. Give you a plus one to mind stages or something. Nice. And we get back to the tavern. The All party right. returns to the tavern. We only have this one return stage right now, but we'll have a whole bunch more in just a few days. Yep. So another thing is we built... We, uh, a lot of this is kind of a, a crazy technical feat, too, because we built uh, like this awesome uh, data system okay. to be able to just pump data through. I mean, it's pretty old school. It's not super user-friendly or anything like that. Um, but Tomo's pretty old school anyway, and he's the one who's wrangling most of it. Makes uh, sense. Along with, along with Sarah and Sean. And uh, it's just a great way to be able for them to be able to add a whole bunch of content quickly mm -hmm. um, and they're just pounding away on adding content all the time nice. uh, like like I said before we've got like what thousands of stages um, we've got the procedural of stages stories. we probably have more than a thousand right uh, we have about 600 quests in the game Wow um, we have like maybe 40 or 50 eh, 40 35 ish or so custom written characters okay. uh, with you know more coming in constantly uh, when we launch the game that's just a point on the timeline um, mm -hmm. Not the idea is we're just going to keep on working through that and keep on trying to continue to improve and expand the experience. Although, just to describe what the, the content upon early access will represent kind of a larger story arc that'll carry you through, like, let's say the first eight to ten levels of the experience. And by the time we get to full release, we want to add two more chunks like that. But mm -hmm. the kind of hidden mass of content that relates to that is that it's more like a, 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 an expanding ray of content. As you play more, as you play further in the game, there needs to be more stuff to kind of fill out the uh, sides of the road and to keep uh, the number of options available to players rich and interesting. No, yeah. Mark. Now we don't have Kender. That's copyright. Kender. Yeah, Kender <laughs> isn't in the open license. By the way, if you make a role-playing game, you'll learn what the open license is with TSR. Yes. Or is it uh, called TSR? What do they call it now? Uh, Wizards of the Coast. Wizards of the Coast. Uh, uh, so, yeah. so. Uh, I'm 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 a I'm I'm an advocate of having red pandas as our next race. Red nice. They're so red fucking cute. <laughs> red pandas. They are cute. Yes. <laughs> you buy um, like a curious sized table. So your adventurers, <laughs> your adventurers came back. They're tired. Take a look at your roster. So the idea is basically that you're going to be able to. Right now, we're in the middle of putting these uh, these tooltips on the effects, but you'll be able to see that that this character is. Uh, is Barton. Has is duration Tired Barton. 3. That's so right. is that three days? or? Yeah, okay. yeah it's three days worth of Tired. Um, now, if you had, like, let's say, if you're a Kickstarter backer and you got, what do we call it now? Bathhouse? Uh, uh, well, Bathhouse is what we're calling right? what the Kickstarter backers. Kickstarter backers, and, or one of the other facilities that could help them out with that. You just throw them in that facility. It takes up a slot, right? right. It might cost some money to do it. Um, but that can rapidly reduce that tire duration. Okay, okay. So you can have them back out on the on the road and adventuring in no time flat at, uh, oh. at tip top shape. Oh, which survivalist am I getting rid of? Speed bar. No, don't do it. They're Terrence valuable in some first. way. Terrence was there first. No, you just have to find a way to make them useful. No, don't Goodbye, do it. Bulug, that was, no, that was no, the, uh, no, Bulug. Goodbye. Goodbye. Oh, jeez. Maybe we'll see you around, Volug. That's okay. I wanted to get a thief in. The thief's got some social <laughs> skills and some mind, well, social and survival skills. Norman Henderson here. Hey, That's Norman. Funny. Oh, and he's a thief. It is a pleasure to make your acquaintance. My friends call me Norman. I'd like a mug of mead. If I get to kill stuff, I'm in. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's an, that's a, that's an error. <laughs> so he's going to tell us a little bit about his personal story. Norman Henderson's another one of our custom characters here, and he goes, "I look around this place, and I'm not just not sure I fit in." Cool. But we're going to hire him anyways. Do you like fighting rats? He wants. And here's another quest. 
And so characters kind of roll in over the course of time uh, when you start up the, the day. Um, and the number of uh, characters in the tavern at any given day varies. Uh, we're trying to hook it up to a Monday through Friday um, typical bar schedule where Tuesday and Wednesday are probably the slow days. Uh, well, Monday is probably a slow day too, but like uh, Thursday, Friday, Saturday being heavier days. Sunday is closed for private event. So Brom Snowflare Fair here, <laughs> who by the way has some awesome social skills, which I hope I can add, get him on my roster. A new quest called BYOR, Eating Rats? Question mark. And this is just across the street. A food vendor across the street scared a rat into his cooking fire and roasted the poor thing alive. Perhaps out of insanity or desperation, he gave it a nibble. Turns out, rat doesn't taste half bad. Flyers circulate claiming, bring your own rat. Get the first grilled free. So I'm going to hire Brom Snow Flare. He's a level one merchant. That's something to point out. Epic Tavern definitely supports classes that are a little unconventional hmm. because we have classes that fixate and focus on being a powerful character against mind challenges or social challenges or survival challenges. Uh, a ranger for us is legitimately useful on any kind of a naturalist type of encounter. Now we have a merchant who is very strong Smart. socially. He's, well, he's yeah. mildly, yeah, he's because, because being a merchant is strong socially, he's, right? He's a yeah. deal maker. He convinces people of yep. stuff. And then each of these traits or skills has these subcategories. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So oh, let's, yeah, look, let's, at the, let's look at social. Here. So mm -hmm. this is the social category of skills that he has available. Okay. And inside each social category, I mean, inside each skill category are, inside each skill class, we call it, is a skill category, which is called persuasion in this case. Persuasion has four skills inside of it, one of which is convince. And diplomacy is another skill category. One of the skills inside diplomacy is contract. So do I get to get more, like, will I ever give it to get to give them more skills or, like, improve the skills? Let's look at the roster and how close we are. So let's, if we send Rosalie and Murgul on some quests, I think very shortly they'll level up and we'll be able to give them, uh, uh, we'll get to assign skill points to them. So uh, Sh Shinru Kensai says, the characters are always in the tavern. It's like a hostel? No, no, they come in. They, they, they walk in the next day. People come in who... You know, some people won't be there every day. It's, it really is a bar pub-like experience. Although the characters on your roster and characters that return from quests, we prioritize them in the, the tavern for the next day. But it is, there is a hostile-like environment sort of because you got all these people and they're, they're hanging out a bunch. We, we did originally rig up, our imagination of how we rigged up the timetable for the day is kind of a, uh, mid to late day into the evening, and the idea was that the adventuring you're seeing is kind of happening from morning to like late, in, late uh, in you know early evening or late in the afternoon or something. Mm. Yeah, we did everything we could to avoid it being like a hostile work environment. <laughs> gotcha. Oh, jeez. That is really, oh, really God, funny. Why? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I am going to oh, just Mark. run this next quest <laughs> Mark. here. Oh. Oh, oh Martin is close, and Rosalie. So we'll bring all okay. these guys along. Yeah, and let's do it. Wait, we need all the guys. It's a social quest. I need to bring Brom, who I just got on the roster. I hear he's the Wait. Brom. He is the Brom. Does it divide the? Ex I, I actually don't know this. Does it divide the experience amongst the people that you bring on the quest? So is um, there is there a is there a in, initiative to? I mean, sorry, an uh, incentive not to bring that many people on a quest. The so way you the math works more is two characters on a quest right. is worth more experience per character. Three is okay. we give you what we're expecting to, mm -hmm. and four is a little bit less. Okay, good. So can I eventually add more more heroes to this thing? So these they seem slots to be locked. are What's actually custom slots what? for story-based characters and anyone you find along the way. Oh, okay. Yeah, and dragons. Dragons? dragons. Yeah. Vehicles is for the DLC. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so mistaken from Ambassadors, the adventurers are invited to a banquet. Oh, oh man. You know what happened here? That means Braum failed. Yep, <laughs> see, our only character with good social skills rolled a poor performance, ah, which yeah. tanked our ability to do well. Yes, the f winds of fate even <laughs> blew with us and moved us from eight to nine. Terrence was no help at all. That's because Terrence and Mergle have no social uh, skills. What a even, terrible thing Even to say. pretending to be from a far off land cannot make up for the adventurer's appalling table manners. <laughs> they are soon shown the door. <laughs> at least they got money for parking. So we have a, like what, like four outcomes possible? 
possible for each, each thing? So each encounter, hour? what we have is we have potentially up to okay. four, minimum two and as many as four results. Okay. Uh, depending on the roles, we have these kind of things we call quirky successes and quirky failures. Um, they're um, an interesting way to rewrite the results so that kind of, uh, uh, so that some percentage of the time you're almost guaranteed even progressively more quirky language and results. We also hide some interesting results in there, so mm. there's random chances of getting some very interesting things, interesting things happen based on like what items you find or the potential to unlock a quest or a character. So Loco Rato says, some characters work better with other characters or will some characters create troops? And only want to be hired as a troop. So now, those ideas we talk about yes. extensively. Yes, yes, And yes. Uh, those are features that are very much on deck the moment we hit early access and continue to work. Working better with other characters is almost a certainty because mm -hmm. the trait system will allow you to have like negative modifiers for if you're like a racist against dwarves or something like that, mm -hmm. and or positive ones. Um, we're still trying to figure out how to, well, we're still trying to figure out what the exact price or cost and resources it will be to get the feature where continued adventuring with other, with other specific characters will create like the, you know, the, the, the vibe of their having a longer term friendship. Mm. Yeah, and possible bonuses based on that. The cold, damp weather makes for miserable travel. Boom, barely, barely succeeded. You can see we're tired is coming into play. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Barely made it. Uh, <laughs> thankfully, the only consequences are a few sniffles and muted spirits. And we got some gold, because why not? Oh, crap. A it's line time. of humanoid winds down the street, waiting to cook their rats. The vendor smiles at each customer. That steps up to his grill and introduces himself as Quan Dooley, modern taste expert. Is Quan Dooley Jamaican? I'm just I, there is no Jamaica here. <laughs> Sorry. There is no yeah, Jamaica that's here. Every time I hear a name like that, I think. There could be a Jamaica. Quan. Quan. <laughs> Quan. Line, Rosalie strikes up a friendly conversation Quan with an Dooley. enormous orc barbarian named Grusilla Marrowsucker. They invite her to stop by the tavern sometime for a grilled rat and maybe an adventure or two. Ooh, so this Grusilla is an example of a quest that unlocks a character. Rusilla Marisucker will be available to chit chat with and potentially add to our roster next turn. And she has her own kind of epic storyline. It's just a happenstance meeting in this case. No. Oh. Scott, do you know us? <laughs> Scotch will fuel development. It has. <laughs> how, how, what percentage of this game would you say is Scotch? Oh, jeez. Okay, there's a lot of hours that we're going to print in the game, so we can't give it like a one to one. That would be a small percentage, but I'd like to say a lot, even though it's <laughs> I mean, probably you, a relatively small percentage. Are you looking for a percentage that's like fully whiskey or just specifically well, scotch? <laughs> you know, like to some extent, right? You know, you turn tacos into code, right? Yeah. Right. Uh, so you're also turning scotch into epic tavern. Scotch, Cheez Its. Okay. Uh, nonsense. So yeah, stock okay. and pretty much with a hyperconnects feel done. <laughs> As you mentioned, DLC, uh, Leo Z asks. Any plans for any content after full release? Oh, for sure. So unless the game tanks, we will support this game as I mean forever. Uh, we have uh, uh, serious aspirations where we can take this game, and that roadmap doesn't end for years. Uh, I think we our goal is to create a rich toy that can turn on anybody's imagination, and that they could pick up again and again and get different results. And um, yeah. So, uh, uh, but in terms of specifically in terms of DLC, mm -hmm. uh, for maybe something somewhere between, you know, four to six months after or less, depending on how well things go or how fast we can work or how big our team can get. Uh, I think we call it something to do mm -hmm. with maritime fantasy mm -hmm. adventure. Uh, <laughs> and my hope is to be able to get um, vehicles. Right. See, we mentioned that before, but yeah. uh, for people to have horses, people to have carts, people to have boats. Uh, maybe be able to put your tavern on a boat and go from port to port or something. Awesome. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's a, I mean the, the way you should think of it is there will be content going into the game on like nearly, a, a, you know, every build will have new content going into it, but the DLC will be a marked departure from what content should be going into the game, I guess. Yeah, the, the, the game's right? free updates are going to be happening constantly, and we're going to maintain that, maintain that as long as possible. DLCs will hopefully expand the game and allow for it to have more functionality, like an aggressive update. Oh, geez. Yeah, yeah shoot, Jack's Jack. in charge Good of uh, doing the mods. <laughs> no, we have a... I think one... You know, I think you can already get the idea that we want to take players, and we want to give them something that makes them happy. And I think an important part of that is 
well, I mean, if we can get the player base involved, uh, uh, we're we're all on board for mod tools oh, and Steam yeah. Workshop. The game was built in such a way to be amenable to having data added. We're going to need to build uh, a, 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 a thing or a game or, or an application interface of some sort to make that uh, easier than it currently is. Yeah. But there's no reason why that can't happen. And there's no reason why that can't allow players to make pretty sweeping changes to the game. Yep. Someone, so, someone, someone who's not going to be in trouble for legal issues can rewrite the fantasy literature of their, of their favorite type or <laughs> kind in, in epic tavern format. Um, okay, so I got a question. Uh, tiredness. Uh, you took somebody out who was tired already. Uh, do they become more tired, or like what? How did? How did? How exactly? Does it that stacks help? the uh, the the. St it, it's kind of like their virtual stacks, uh, like a, a debuff. Uh, they'll they'll be they'll, so like it'll, another it'll token maintain, goes on top yeah, of their it'll stack. Yeah, maintain their tiredness. Okay. I know the answer to a lot of these questions. Yeah, but they're good questions to ask. <laughs> <laughs> You'll thank me when you hear this. Tell me more. <laughs> Back for seconds. Every time I see Tell Me More, I think of, like, Jet Black from Cowboy Viva. <laughs> <laughs> um, so here's how, uh, here's how we kind of... Um, is this the end of the rats chain? Or There's is one it? more after this. There's but one after this. So, right? so okay. this chain of rats quest, by the way, leads you to having the wine cellar. And then that'll increase the number of drinks you can have available to you. Uh, right, exactly. Zombie rats, though. So basically you have a, a cleaning crew that's a bunch of kobolds. And they head down in the cellar to, to kind of clean things up. Uh, they slam the door behind them a minute later, you know, huffing and puffing, having run up, back up the stairs. And so you look down and see what, what's going on down there. And somehow the rodents that have been, that were killed in the previous stage have been reanimated as zombie rats. It's beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's see, let's, is this uh, Drusilla? I don't see Drusilla. I don't see her. Dugorm stab. First. Maybe she shows up later. Oh, hook Dugorm stab. Oh, there you are, Drusilla. Oh yeah, there she is. Drusilla Marrow Sucker. What a week. <laughs> Drusilla, met some of your friends over barbecued rat. I'm in the mood to break something or someone. Oh, you might have to get somebody off your your roster for her. Yeah, I know. But either way, oh. roster limit. Click to manage. No, never. Who are we gonna get rid of? Somebody who's tired. Oh, I can't get rid of Bra Norman. Nope. I like Norman. Brahms are a social guy. Oh, the pressure. Terrence, get rid of him. He's got to go. He's level two. He's got to go. Uh, Terrence is 200 away from level up. He's got to go. All right, there it is. He's got to go. And now, I'm kicking this person from the roster, but mm -hmm. the people that have come to the tavern repeatedly will still come to the tavern. So you can get them back on your roster, not at any time, but at some point in the future. So like things aren't shuffle. lost. Yeah. Okay. Right. I'm in the mood to break something or someone. Yeah, I'm totally broke. Have any work available? Up for some conversation? What is best in life? To crush your enemies, see them driven before you, and hear the lamentation of their men. Oh, jeez, are we going to get sued? <laughs> <laughs> I think that counts as... Um, parody? Parody, yeah. Okay. Th those legal issues matter, by the way. Don't take them too lightly. Well, we've, <laughs> we've finally achieved parody. <laughs> nice. Oh, jeez. Jokes over jokes, huh? Yep, doing it. <laughs> I'm all in on the stupid dad jokes. So I'm kind of like <laughs> jumping over, kind of browsing the parties. I know a lot of the characters and I know who I kind of, I'm kind of moving us through because I want to see if we can quickly get to an unlocking of what? Our wine cellar. Oh, and we'll, yeah. we'll see the uh, interface change. Red eyes glow menacingly in the darkness. Norman looks a bit ap apprehensive as the zombie rats swarm forward. It's kind of scary zombie rats. Zombie rats fare no better against the heroes than they did while alive. <laughs> Who would reanimate <laughs> a bunch of tavern rats? Tor Norman wonders aloud. The party returns to the tavern. Okay, and here's how everything went. We're gonna skip divvying the loot. Boom. Oh I'm no, you're so greedy, tell me why. <laughs> Actually, this screen has been redone very yeah. recently. Yeah. It looks a lot better. Yep. It's like an overview of kind of the, I guess, the business side? It's like yeah. your business ledger, yeah. Okay. Well, at the beginning of the turn. In the, and when it's redone, it's going to tell you more than the business stuff. It's going to tell you kind of important events that have happened. Okay, okay. Um, on the adventures, it's going to 
Uh, eventually going to tell you about the rival taverns and what their status is. Um, yeah, it's going to, but mostly it's, it serves to kind of as a wrap up to your day, <coughs> your tavern's day overall. Oh, okay. okay. Um, it's a good way to kind of, for us to kind of bring everything together, that uh, all the different parts of the game. So Morgul has something to say. The Wine Matron isn't so bad a place if you can find it. Ooh. That reference is one of the quests that they went on. Nice. <coughs> I need to drink less starting tomorrow. What was that guy's name? Dave? <laughs> so I can I can hire this person, but of course my uh, uh, roster is full. And actually, the schedule for unlocking roster slots is actually in the middle of being worked on presently. Uh, you have somebody who might be leveling up. Is that is that working? Is that what right roster up? Is? Oh look, there it is. That's what I was looking for. Another thing. So Mergul okay. is now I can now level up. So I click the level up button, it flashes this. I have five skill points. Ah. And I can choose to increase Fireball, Burning Hands, Flame Shield, Pyrotechnics, Sense Magic, or Break Illusion. And so I kind of look to my roster here and I, I look at the having only two characters with a, kind of any rash and reasonable number of combat skills. Uh, Mind is pretty low too. Well, you got three characters though. Yeah, and social certainly on the weekend, but this person doesn't have any social skills. So I'm going to go ahead and split my points between combat and mind pretty evenly, I think. So even if their skills don't show up in like the roster list, those they still have those abilities that can be rolled on or yeah. compared in the battle. Right. Yeah, um, like if it's a combat stage, we're going to take your combat skills in aggregate, regardless right. of where they come from. Okay. But specific skills, when you have them and they match the needs of the encounter, uh, are worth more. So oh, okay. um, if you look on the left, you're, you're seeing basically right there on the adventure roster, you're seeing the focus. And the focus is just kind of like a really quick look way to tell what those what those individual adventures adventurers specialize in. Yeah, these are kind of so like top hands for top their, two. their power levels. Yeah. Okay, okay. Um, so they might have like, for instance, one that has these on right now um, with combat and mind. They might have social, but it's just not as you know their mainline skill. Yeah, it's actually, like a tertiary military specialty. If you're a GI Joe a good fan, example because the doctor has mostly points in survival because that's where first aid and surgery and diagnosis lie. Okay. And then they have some points in social, sab warfare, inspire education, and then one point in swords and axes in this case, and one point in uh, mind skill. Weird that a doctor's social survival, but in our, in our world, survival is about healing people. Mm -hmm. Whereas a thief is about mind, because mind is locks and traps and avoid detection. Some of those choices we made you can uh, you might disagree with, and we'd love to hear your thoughts if you you know if you want to talk about it. These are fun conversations to have, by the way. How do you break all of the classical encounters in all of the fantasy literature you've known into four categories and four decent categories? And you gotta like reconstitute um, that into an experience, right? That, yeah, like, yep. conveys some mm -hmm. of these elements, right? Yep, it was, it's a ton of fun. It's a little painful, but it's worth it. <laughs> so Leo Z eighty eight says, does the map affect the quests? And it does in that the longer the, the path of travel is, the more random things are going to occur. And let me get to the map really quick here. Sweet. So it's not visible right now, and I think we just have to turn on some displays, but this area is broken into three major spaces. One is the, uh, I call it, like, kind of, we call it easy, the easy forest in, in the office, but it's the area in the local, er the local area of the tavern. Just north where you see those castles is the kind of capital city of Bayor. Actually, the capital city of Bayor is really kind of in this area here, where this kind of like uh, island is as mm -hmm. well. And then up and over here, which it is not visible, but there is uh, another area where we where, where the Mage College is. And so for the early access, um, first section of the uh, storyline happens kind of amongst those areas. And depending on which of those areas your party is traveling, uh, you might get different encounters and uh, you might get different difficulties as well. And I smell a rat. Let's just get this thing on the road here. Social bomb is a must. We'll bring Rosalie to stack our, stack our chances. Gotta have Mergle. Oh crap. Never seen such a beautiful sunset, Brahm exclaims. Yay, the merchant runs ahead, completely enthralled by the scenery. <laughs> the other heroes hurry to catch up. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of these text strings also, you make a lot of use of, um, uh, of uh, um, they, they, they draw <laughs> on the data. Okay. Rom and Mergle link wow. arms and skip down the path whistling cheery tunes. Wow. The, char 
The character of this quest is very, very happy and a little, little musical. <laughs> so approaching the farmer's market, Murgle says, we better find this necromancer soon. The rats are bad enough, but if they start reanimating our dead flies, we'll be in real trouble. Oh, man. Boom. Zombie rats, chuckles Lucas the face fishmonger. A vendor here recently had a similar problem. You should talk to the fortune teller, Amelia Mortalis. Go easy on her, though. She's just trying to help in her own weird way. And here, even though uh, a number of characters were tired, they had also, as a result of something that must have happened, which I don't know exactly, I probably have to look skipping, back. skipping down. I the thought it was maybe the sunset. The sunset, sunset yeah. might have that, that catchy, you know, <laughs> the, the 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 cheer, right? The <laughs> so even though a travel stage doesn't actually have an effect, and you can't win or lose in that stage, <laughs> ah. we can add effects and we can give you rewards as well. And so I think that actually did happen. They got the inspired effect and get, got a bonus to their to their rolls as a result. Uh, we beat the daylights out of this one. This one would have been a good candidate if our next set of features come in. Uh, we have a whole system of uh, giving the players uh, loot chests to bring back to the tavern and open up. Oh yeah. Who doesn't like opening up a chest and finding cool stuff inside? Oh no. The Wait. party stands before a huge maze. None of them recall how they got here. <laughs> what? Sometimes you struggle to make mind encounters. Alright. Heroes find their way through the maze. How this happened is still not clear. That sounds like a Tomo, Tomo already. I think that was one I wrote. <laughs> Maybe not, though. Uh, party returns to the tavern. And so, um, Rich, you want to kind of like draw on some of your history of the development stories while I kind of, I'm going to bash my way through to getting to the uh, next, uh, through the next quest. Sure thing. Uh, sure thing. Ben, uh, anything you want to ask? Um, uh, well, let's talk about, I guess, you know, in order to form a timeline, mm -hmm. we kind of talked about the inspiration already, but... Uh, how long has this been in development and what i know that you know keeping a studio open right makes it difficult to put all of your you know you can't put all of your attention into this game no. all the time absolutely not um but you have periods where you could mm -hmm. and what does that look like is it what, almost a year and a half two years like yeah it's um it's uh, almost two years now mm -hmm. that we've been in development um and it, it, so the studio was started with the purposeful strategy of making it so that it was like, you know, the goal was to put about 75% of our energy into doing uh, kind of contract work okay. and to keep the lights on and to fund the other 25%, which is, you know, creating our own uh, unique IP. And that has worked to a certain extent. Mm -hmm. um, we definitely did go out of our way to, you know, we did a Kickstarter, which was nice. We got a, not only did we get some money out of it, um, but we got a whole bunch of really great fans out of that too. Yeah. Um, you know, started our kind of what I what I think of as the core of our community. Um, but yeah, it's a, it's it's been it's been quite a road. Um, you know, we got some some private investment for it, which was nice. It's not super easy thing to do. Right. Um, but you know, we just we put together what we thought was just a really great pitch. Um, it helped a lot to get into Kickstarter to do. I mean, so here's the thing. What I would say is I don't I don't know how many people in the audience are are up for making their own games or whatever, but um, the way that we use Kickstarter was not necessarily as a way to fund our whole game mm -hmm. because games cost a lot to make. Yeah, I mean usually just to put it in perspective, for every person that you have working on a game, it's going to cost a studio who's doing things right uh, about ten thousand dollars a month, about with all told to yeah. keep that person going, just one person going for a month. Wow. So. Every, if you have like, let's say three, four people working on a game, that's $40,000 a month, right? And games are not, they don't come out in a month or two months right. if you're working on with like three, four people, unless they're a really simple game. Our game's not a simple game. So, so we had to go, you know, beyond what we got with the Kickstarter and, you know, sustain ourselves through, through work, um, sustain, <laughs> hey, what's going on, Zacharoni and Cheese? Um... We had to sustain ourselves through, through you know, kind of like I said, outside help, mm -hmm. the Kickstarter, through you know, not paying ourselves very much, yeah, you know, definitely. just making you know, making sure that we can make every single dollar count towards getting this thing. And we, you know, there have been times when we put, you know, we've definitely, especially going into the end here, we're putting everything into, you know, the forward deflector shields and, right. and the engines <laughs> just and just rush, pushing you know, forward across, press through, forward, right? Yeah. Um, life support is at a, at a minimum right now. So. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's a, it's 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 not easy and it's not cheap. 
I mean, we've had people come through and go like, oh, you guys raised like, you know, 70K on your Kickstarter. Like, yeah. there's no excuse for why you shouldn't be out by now. And I'm like, dude, you have no idea Absolutely. how little money yeah. 70K is if you're, if you know, if you're paying people. Um, so, you know, games just, especially a game like this, it's not a, you know, it's not a game that, you know, it's obviously it's complex, right? So, and it's a game that is not really done. It's not like, hey, we're going to do a, you know, first person right. horror game where you're, you know, we're really, we're, you know, we're really fixated on the polish and timing and everything of the experience. It's something that, that is, you know, from a theoretical point of view, extremely complex. And we have some of the smartest people that I know of working on this game. Mm. I know a lot of people, I know a lot of smart people, and these are some of the smartest people I know, you know, working on this to make it feel good and feel right. Um, if you play a lot of games like, you know, and definitely apologies to, to games like Football Manager, um, those games are not the easiest to get into, right? Right. And so one of the things that we wanted to do was make a game that was fairly easy for your average everyday person to pick up and, and get into um, and still have that depth of, you know, complexity yeah. that a good management, um, a good RPG, a good, you know, social simulation game would have. And um, I mean, what makes it, you know, unique in, in the, this category mm -hmm. is kind of the thing that makes it difficult to sell at the same time, right? Mm -hmm. Especially when you're talking with investors or even running a Kickstarter campaign, mm -hmm. like, which seemed to go pretty well for you guys. Mm -hmm. Like, that was a very that's a very it's a very hard sell it's like mm -hmm. you probably don't play this type of game but we have a really cool idea for this mm -hmm. thing and it's not just that type of game well, it's, right? it, it's kind of amazing because i like it was the the idea really just clicks with people mm -hmm. and you wouldn't think that it necessarily would right it's because it is a pretty complex and weird idea but but people get it and and it it surprises me on a you know on a daily basis because I'll talk to people and people will be like, man, I'm really into Epic Tavern, I'm really into it, and I'm like, all right, dude, like, what do you actually think Epic Tavern right. is? And do they hit it like ninety percent, they tell you what it is. like eighty, ninety percent? <laughs> and I'm like, oh, okay, I guess you do kind of get it, right? Yeah. And I mean, I was sitting a, around a table of game developers the other day, um, you know, pe people that are in the industry are like very you know tangential, tangential to it, and I asked them, well, what do you think Epic Tavern is? And they go, oh, well, it's this. And then somebody else goes, well, it's this. And the other one goes, well, it's this. And none of them had the whole picture. Mm -hmm. But putting all three of their things together uh, actually was the, the whole picture. Okay. And I'm expecting people to go, oh, it's going to be like this great thing where you can go take your guys out and you fight. And right. you, you get in these like turn-based fights or whatever. And nobody thinks that, which is w one of my biggest fears. And people are going to come in and take a look at the game and go, oh, I don't get to yeah. do like t turn, you know, Final, F Final Fantasy style fighting with my guys. Interesting. Yeah, that's not what the game's about. There was a, there was a certain amount of uh, trepidation with that amongst the team when we're yeah. we're developing it because we're like, I don't know if people are down with this. Interesting. Oh, you have two two parties out now. I have two quests now. Nice. Okay. Um, speaking of like big fears, what are the what are the hardest things to overcome over the course of this project? Mark, can we use the she making money? <laughs> <Nice>. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, honestly, those, yeah, I know, those, those are definitely the. Honestly, for Epic Tavern, mm -hmm. it it's that we have a bunch of smart people on the project, and we think we're smart, <laughs> and that's a bit of a problem because when we all get together, we multiply the complexity of what it is we're trying to make. Okay. And so we found ourselves probably trying to cope with something that might have been an easy order of magnitude more than we could chew. Yep. And so here we are, you know, several months after we wanted to release the game, um, but very, it's very satisfying to be here. I think what. You know, obviously, you love, you love, you know, if you make, you put an idea together and you fall in love with it mm -hmm. and you have to keep kind of like reanalyzing on like, am I making the right call here? I feel like I'm losing objectivity. I got to get that back. And we keep asking ourselves that and um, uh, having enough discipline to be responsible enough to make something you love happen, probably the hardest part. Okay. <laughs> oh, yeah, dude. I mean, like, and there's a certain amount of stress that goes into it, right? It's like, okay, well. You know, it's not often that you're, a, that you're a game developer and you come up with an idea and you like it and then you tell it to other people <laughs> and they like it. Yeah. And it's not just like they're bullshitting you, right? It's like they actually really like it, like enough to put money down on it. Because, you know, and that, that's oh, what happened. It's just one of our bugs. Oh, okay. Hey. <laughs> uh, yeah, Locoratos was there for that. He you guys was there look for the conversation. Tough. Parties being multiply, uh, instantiated multiple times. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm shocked we don't have more bugs than we do because this sh 
complex. Well, it the problem with this bug is that it's actually like it's it's deep in there, and and what we, we know, huh? it appears just from a development thing for you guys to know about is this bug is something that's been there for a long time that the first few times we thought we fixed it, all we really did was we removed the conditions that make it happen. Right. But it's, it fails elegantly yeah. enough, it appears. We'll see. But, so to kind of riff on what I was saying before, like, mm -hmm. you know, you get, you get an idea that you like that all of a sudden other people like, and you're like, oh shit, oh shit. Like, yeah. This doesn't happen very often, right? It's like when you, you find a girl, you know, or, or whatever, a guy, whatever. Yeah. And, and you're like, and you're like, oh my God, I like this person. Oh my God, they appear to like me. Right. Oh my God, <laughs> am difficult. I gonna fuck this up? Like, I, I fuck <laughs> things up all the time. Every day I'm fucking things up. Yeah. And this is important. Like, this is important. I need to do this. This needs to happen. And, you know, that itself can get in the way. It causes like, a, you know, a certain amount of trepidation as yeah, well. Yeah, yeah. Right? So, you know, and that's your, your enemy. Fear is, fear is the mind killer. Um, so, you know, getting past that, I think, is a, is a big deal too, right? Because, I mean, for the most part, if you're relaxed and you're, you're doing it right, like, this game is, this game, when you make the right choices in this game, it just seems to make sense, Okay. you know, what you're doing. Um, you, there's times when we're pushing things too hard, that, and we just go, hey, look, maybe we should stop pushing this, because maybe right. it just doesn't fit. Or like, you're focusing on the wrong problem, yeah. or... Exactly. Yeah, absolutely. So... I mean, and it's just, you know, it's it's also the thing, too, of the classic indie problems of, you know, how do we get it out there? How do we let people know about it, right? Getting because, the word out is, yeah. is, is complicated, yeah. yeah. Or, well, it's complicated for us old-timers, because yeah. we don't... We're still pretty... Yep. ...out of the loop on all this Twitch stuff and, and getting words out to everybody. We want to, and we're learning a lot every step of the way, but, man, when we meet people that know this stuff, they're like ninjas at it. Yeah. Like y'all. Thank you, Shinyu <laughs> Kensai. Thank you for thing. Will I be able to change the UI size, asked Leo Z, remove it if I want to see the tavern. Right now, that is, there is an, there is a, 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 an edit mode where you'll be able to change the colors of the walls and some of the furniture and stuff, and that gives you a much bigger view of the tavern. Yeah, he's talking about actually removing like the in the tavern thing, like collapsing it or whatever. Oh, uh, just kind of scooting things aside and yeah. sitting there. Yeah, I mean, it's something we discuss. Um, you know, and, and something we'll definitely consider as we go on, especially if people really want to be able to do that. Yeah, if we hear uh, people wanting it, then yeah. we'll, well, there it is. Yep. <laughs> um, but, you know, uh, at this point, it's like, I... And that's part of the hard decisions, too. It's like, mm -hmm. there's so many ways we can go. Like, where do, right. we, put our, where do we put our effort, right? And mm -hmm. that's something that Tomo and I have to deal with on, you know, on every single day basis, um, is, like, how should people be spending their time? Right. Because we only have a certain amount of time. Right. And there's a lot of stuff to do that, or that we could be doing. Like, are we, are we making the most out of every, every minute that we've got? And like, to that end, um, what is an acceptable like, state of completion? Going from you know, early access That's a fucking hard one. to fucking Especially. shipped, right? Like, yeah. I mean, even going into early access, because again, like, it's like Tomo said, we're, we're kind of old timers. I mean, I don't know if we didn't right. talk too much about where we came from, but. I mean, I would love to go yeah. into that. Well, know. we we met together. We met um, the two of us and, and uh, our other partner, Dave. We met at, uh, at Treyarch mm -hmm. and James Chow, who I had mentioned before, who's worked on, on the art. And um, Eric. And Eric. Senior designer who lives out in upstate New York. Yeah. So a lot of us met while we were working on a game called Spider Man 2. And uh, Eric, actually, the three of those guys. Eric, Chow, Tomo on Spider-Man 1, and then uh, Eric and I, or no, uh, I came on Spider-Man 2, Dave came on Spider-Man 2 as well, um, and then we, you know, from there we just kept friends or whatever, but, you know, it, that, was, that was back in the days when there was no such thing as DLC. Right. You know, there were like, no such no thing, thing as, as updates. No such thing as a patch, right? Oh, <laughs> well, it, there, was a, there was a bug in Spider-Man 2 where... You could play as Mary Jane, but then what? somebody complained because you could, if you're playing as yeah, Mary Jane, the, you, you, you kiss, kiss Mary, Mary Jane, Jane at the end. <laughs> at the end. <laughs> Somehow that was this huge problem. It was problem. a big freaking deal <laughs> oh my God. for people or whatever because, you know, stupidity. And uh, so not only, not only did we, so that was the old school version of a DLC where, or a patch where they just had to reissue like... Yeah, the discs going forward had that. Oh, Tons wow. of discs. Yeah. Tons. Okay, okay. At, at a humongous cost. I don't even remember what the numbers were. 
but it was just just ungodly well, amount of money that they had to pay. You know, I think the bottom that. line is that you know we've been making games for a long time, mm. and uh, you know back in the early two thousands things were just really different. Yeah, and it was different. We were on big teams. Uh, the budgets were were you know by then the budgets had already gotten big. Mm -hmm. There's like a marketing department. You know, there's there's stockholders, and it's all it's all it was all stuff that we were mostly sheltered from. I mean, mm. our experience making games in console are being part of a big family and not having to worry about stuff. Uh, nice. yep. Having gone indie in the last three years and running the company mm -hmm. has uh, been a really good learning experience. We got to, you know, have to be adults, sort of. Yep. It's and cool. It, and I mean, look, we're learning everything over, right? I mean, when we're approaching, when we're approaching early access, we go, well, how good is good enough? And a lot right. of our, you know, our experience working on those old school AAA games where it's got to be perfect the first time out, right? Or nearly perfect. Yeah, you it's have an urge. You have this urge. <laughs> yeah, this and urge it's to the make wrong perfect urge, wow. right? Right. <laughs> like we're we are mentally not ready to do stuff like uh, the guys. Oh, man, I'm like blanking on the the name of the the game, but uh, it's by two brothers uh, what, in what a is? van. No, oh, sorry. <laughs> I know two brothers uh, who it's a it's a like a build like a builder game, kind of like Dwarf Fortress, but it's 3D. I forget what the name uh, the name like of it is. City Maybe some in the audience. Or? No, it's a it's it's a very indie game. But they okay. they came out with their game when it when there was you could barely do anything in the game, like the game hardly worked. Okay. Um, it was just right at the beginning. Oh, um, uh, uh, the dwarf. I d dwarf. The, dwarf. Dwarf. No. If Memmij was on, he could. Yeah, Memmij Memmij would be able to tell. <laughs> but yeah, I'm, I'm blanking on the name. But I know exactly what it is, and I was I was a Kickstarter supporter of theirs. But we I don't think are mentally capable of putting a game out that mm. is so early on. And they uh, did it, and they did just fine. And they really involved people from the very, very ground up in their development. But for us, we're like, no, it's got to be at least a certain amount of, like, like showable well, I mean, to be yeah, able and, to put it out, right? And every game is going to have, like, a different set of, like, constraints. Yep. Okay. Depending on its audience, depending on the, you know, the financial state of the company, mm -hmm. depending on how many resources you have yep. available and all that stuff. Um, but, yeah, it's, it's a constant struggle to figure out what the right call is. Um, you just have to pay a ton of attention, mm -hmm. and you have to, there's a certain amount of courage, and that's just... That uncertainty <laughs> is scary, and it never gets less scary. <laughs> and it, it seems at least that that you're that you're you know I don't know if I should say traditional, but like you know your experience in 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 big games mm -hmm. is armed you with a lot of information to make a lot of cool things happen. I mean, yeah. I saw something about the yep. dozens of you know quite a few projects that Hyperk has gone through. Yeah, successfully. that helped a lot. Actually, that's crazy yeah. cool. Oh, and that experience yeah. is huge. Yep. And I mean. I became a much better designer when I had to actually work for myself, and then eventually work for mm -hmm. uh, work uh, uh, as a uh, as starting hyperkinetic. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, dealing with lots of different clients and learning how important it is to kind of like have like a higher level communications skills that allow you to kind of like manage finding like finding a good match first and foremost. Because if it's a bad match, then yes isn't a good idea. Mm. And then once you see that there is a good match, getting to that yes moment is, it takes a lot of a, well, it's, see, we had a lot of good friends. Uh, we can't, we can't take all the, we can't take all the, all the good blame because we also buy, over the course of like the decade and a half leading up to, um, or more leading up to Hyperkinetic, we built up a pretty robust network of friends in the uh -huh. game industry and those, those people, if you, any of you are watching, it's like, thank you. I mean, we wouldn't have been able to do it without you guys. Uh, connections, the connections, actual, you know, straight up projects sometimes. Yep. And an un, unending amount of knowledge. Oh, yeah. And I mean, the feedback that we've gotten on this, but, you know, and, and our team. Our teams are just amazing. Like, everybody that we've got working on this game is not only extremely talented, but they're they're extremely mature, right? Mm -hmm. And and that's so important in in running a team that is, you know, also trying to do a whole bunch of, you know, pulling people off and putting them on the contract projects or whatever. Yeah. I'm feeling that we've, 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 we've exceeded the number of errors that is acceptable. Uh-oh. Let's just see what happens here. Uh, it's holding up. Not bad, not bad. So, we're so what's happening is we're seeing quests. one quest, and now I'm gonna cause even more trouble, but I wanna see a different quest. Not bad, so far. Oh, what in the world? And now the adventurers go their separate ways. Those are the two parties, yeah. I want to be able to sense stuff like that in the future and just go. Hey, I want to go see what finder. I want to 
and see what happened here. By the way, it's this kind of logic. Uh, th this we have this real time um, execution of the of the quest, and when you have multiple going, mm. we support you to switch freely between the the multiple threads, and the other threads continue on while you're while you're looking at one particular one. So gotcha. there's the reason why that bug is there is because inside here there's actually a great deal of complexity. Yeah. And it holds up. Yeah, here to hold up fine. So when something interesting here is when a quest actually ends, that's when we that's when we show the uh, the, you know, the the story here. Oh, we made it. So, does the uh, audience have any uh, questions that they'd oh, like answered? Shit. Well, yeah, I started adding question. random. <laughs> and yeah, like, um, yeah, all that time making AAA games, though, I feel like the moment I got out is when I really started to learn. I learned a lot of really important skills, and I became a specialist in my... In, in game design and with a particular number of genres, and that mm -hmm. felt good. And I certainly, I was having, I, I very much enjoyed making games. I still do. Um, but, you know, becoming an a independent contractor and, and starting the company, really, when you, have to, when you have to worry about everything, or potentially anything, then you get better knowledge about everything, kind of. How did you know it was time to, to get the team together? That's Intersection. That's that the, the three of us were had the time at the same time, and it was we the opportunity presented itself, and I think we were just all ready, so we, we did it. I mean, it didn't take a whole lot of conversation, honestly. It si kind of seemed like intersection question mark. Yes, here we go. <laughs> conversation because it was, it was originally Dave and I that started, and shortly, shortly after that, come up on, and I think that really the conversation was I almost said he's interested. What do you think? Yeah, of course. All right. Brilliant. Sign. <laughs> <laughs> that was really seriously the extent of the conversation. I'm not kidding. <laughs> so now we've gotten just enough turns in now. This is where the kind of the, the meaty experience of the game starts rolling in where there are three quests that are available. It does not feel like two weeks have gone by, I'll tell you that. Well you guys were talking and I ran through some <laughs> a bunch of a bunch of turns, but yeah, that's we're we're what, turn seventeen at this point. So, so what's the long game? The long term. Well, so we've started to get just the inklings of some longer term storylines, and your relationship with these characters is building uh, higher and higher. And so some of these characters are about to start exposing you to some of their personal, well, you can say personal problems, but it sounds kind of kind of negative. But they're, they're some serious issues that they need to deal with or that they'll need help with. And so those, uh, the, the game starts handing off from kind of um, you learning the ropes of being a novice tavern owner and you know kind of leveling up your tavern so it goes from being the kind of like the kind of new tavern that needs a lot of work mm -hmm. to a, you know the regular tavern that everything started to run and hum fine and right about that time everyone's personal stories start kicking in and some more serious storylines start up um there is an overarching storyline to the game the the first content the first chunk of content for early access which involves uh, a legendary story about a party of adventurers that went out and saved the world 10 years earlier, and you'll get to kind of um, uncover all the mystery relating to that story, and it'll have some pretty significant consequences for, for you yourself as the tavern keeper. Mm. Uptown mm. Keg, we're going to unlock a, a thing of beer soon. Hmm? So, um... Let me check. Uh, what are we at here? I'm doing it. It's a quarter, quarter, quarter to. Okay. And how long six. have we been streaming? I mean, um, about an hour and a half, hour forty-five. Okay. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I mean, what I you think guys we covered like. a lot of what yeah. the game has to offer. Um, and like, it, it's nice that it takes this long to start really prying open some of the seams of, yeah. of how thing of, of the various stability issues that do exist. And you know. It, there was no catastrophic uh, consequences of running an uh, unstable version of the game. That's pretty fun. <laughs> yeah, totally. <laughs> it's a good sign. Um, I guess we have the trailer, of course. If you want to yeah. close with that, but if you have anything oh, else yeah? to say, let me go poke. Uh, let me go poke chat and see who's alive. Sounds um, good. But yeah, let me. Um, I don't know. Let me get that up real quick. Okay. All right. Totally informally. Very cool. Uh, very cool. And this has been great. Love chatting about the game with you, and it's been cool. It's a pleasure to have you guys, and oh, I'm so man. happy you finally came up here. <laughs> Thanks, man. <laughs> and we'll have to do it again sometime. Yeah, this place is awesome. Uh, yeah, I guess we're ready for the trailer. I didn't know my TD was on that. All right. Sweet. <laughs>